Good morning and welcome to worship. I want to read from Psalm 30 this morning as we get ready uh, to begin our worship service. I will exalt you, Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. Lord, my God, I called to you for help and you healed me. You, Lord, brought me up out of the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down to the pit. Sing the praises of the Lord, you, his faithful people. Praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. Let's rejoice this morning as we go into the presence of our Heavenly Father and worship him together. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. 
When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed only through dear remains My orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested and my life began Your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made Was a ransom he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me do. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us a new now life begins with you. Our Savior's laid on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoiced as the heaven had lost. Jesus arose with our freedom in hell. That's when death was arrested by life again. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new, now life begins with you. We're free, free, forever we're free. Come join the song of all the redeemed. Yes, we're free, free. Forever amen, when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, we're free, free, forever we're free. Come join the song of all the redeemed. Yes, we're free, free, forever amen, when death was arrested and my life began. When death was arrested and my life began. When death was arrested, my life began. Good morning. Turn in your Bible, please, to Psalm chapter 146. We're going to read verses 1 through 6. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, he remains faithful forever. 
Would you join me as we pray together? O oh, eternal and faithful God, it is a marvelous thing that you have reached out to us in our sinful state to redeem us. You are indeed loving, faithful, and worthy of all, all our praise. Your majesty and wisdom are on constant display in your creation. Your blessings fall on us like rain each and every day. We would be foolish to put our trust in finite rulers and princes, yet that is often what we do. We are prone to fear and worry, lapses of faith and selfishness. Forgive us, Father, for these transgressions as we confess them to you. Thank you for Jesus Christ, his sacrifice, and the resulting adoption into your kingdom for all who call on his name. Thank you for your Holy Spirit given to all believers to comfort and guide. And thank you for the church and its mission. We pray for the worldwide church as well as our local body to be encouragers in the faith, proclaiming your word, doing good work, in order that you will be praised and glorified. Give us strength for the challenges ahead, as well as wisdom and discernment as we navigate the world. We lift up the missionaries and ministries we support, asking for your blessing upon their work. Thank you for calling us to support them and to pray for them. We pray for the lost, that your spirit will stir their hearts, open their eyes, and move them towards repentance. Lead and position us to serve in these divine moments. As we worship you this morning and receive teaching from your word, we pray that it will be pleasing to you and work godly change in our lives for your glory. Bless Seth for his obedience to you, for we pray this in your son's precious name. Amen. As we start back up in our journey through the book of Acts today, we're going to be in chapter 12. We've seen over the last few weeks that there have been times of peace for the early church, but for a majority of the time, it seems that there's upheaval and there's persecution that they're facing most of the time. At the end of chapter 11, we're told that the gospel was being received by Jewish and Gentile people alike in areas like Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch. But while the gospel is being received in those places, at the beginning of chapter 12 here, we see that in Jerusalem, there are still people who are actively working against the message of the gospel. In the past, it's been powerful Jewish religious leaders who have been persecuting the uh, early church. But today, we'll see that another powerful figure finds out that he can gain influence and glory for himself by working against the church. Let's read Acts 12, 1 through 4. It says, it was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. Now this name, Herod, is a familiar name in the New Testament. We hear about Herod in the story of the birth of Jesus, but this is a different Herod. In fact, there were three different kings of the Herodian dynasty, all called Herod, that are mentioned in the New Testament. Herod the Great was the ruler of Judea when Jesus was born. He was the one who visited with the wise men in that 
that ordered all the young boys in Bethlehem to be killed. Then his son, Herod Antipas, took over as ruler, and he is the Herod who's mentioned in the story of the crucifixion, where after Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, finds no fault with Jesus, he has Jesus sent to Herod Antipas. And Antipas just sort of sees Jesus as a novelty, and he sends him back to Pilate. Now here in the book of Acts, we meet Herod Agrippa, and he's the grandson of Herod the Great. And he ruled in Judea for really only about four years, but we see from the scripture here today that he wasn't too much different from the rest of his family. He's really just out for himself, and he has no desire to submit to God or to rule in a godly way. It seems like he sees the early church as an easy target and a way to gain attention and favor with some of the people in Jerusalem. So he arrests some of the early Christians intending to persecute them. And we see in this passage a truth that many of us may feel much too familiar with. Suffering is a part of the Christian life. Actually, the truth is that suffering is a part of life, period. The only difference in the Christian life is that our suffering can be a point of growth and learning for us and can bring glory to God. We're told here that Herod has James put to death with the sword. I mean, James was one of the big names. He was an original disciple called specifically by Jesus. Not only that, but he was part of this inner circle. There were 12 disciples, but Jesus had a closer relationship with Peter, James, and John. And here in this passage, we're, we have two of those inner circle apostles suffering. James is executed, killed with a sword, and Peter is now in prison. This is one of those situations that's hard for us to wrap our minds around. We know that God has the power to change any situation that we're in, but sometimes he chooses not to work things out in a way that we wish that he would. And just like suffering is a part of life, even the Christian life, the sovereignty of God is a fact of life as well. There are going to be countless times in our life when we go through things and things are going to happen that we don't like and we don't understand and we don't expect. And part of our decision to put our faith and our trust in God is also accepting and submitting to his sovereignty. This past Thursday in our Bible study here at the church, we were reading John chapter 6. And at the end of that chapter, Jesus challenges his followers with a difficult teaching about his body and his blood. And many of them couldn't accept it. In John 6, 66 through 69, we read this. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. It was because of this faith and belief that the 12 disciples were able to then follow Jesus to the end. Despite difficult teachings, painful circumstances, and seemingly insurmountable tragedy, James, who was put to death by Herod, died because of his belief in Jesus. And Peter, who spoke those words, to whom shall we go? You have the words of life. Now he's in prison because of his faith in Jesus. But we'll see that God's sovereignty is still very much intact as we continue in Acts 12. In verse 5, it says, So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Even though Peter was all by himself with these guards in prison, his family and the church was directly involved in the whole situation. They knew that even though there was no earthly answer to the situation that Peter was facing, there was still hope. And it was exactly, or it is exactly the same for us. Our prayers are important powerful and effective. If I'm honest, it sometimes feels inadequate to tell somebody that I'll pray for them. It seems like there should be something more that, that I could do. And sometimes there is. So we can't use prayer as an excuse for us to not physically help somebody if we're able to. However, there is nothing more important in any endeavor that we go into or any situation we're in than constant earnest prayer. We never know what our prayers can lead to. The only thing we can actually know is that if we don't pray, we're missing out on our involvement in God's plan. I want to remind you of something that we haven't talked about in several months. I haven't done a good job of talking about this or reminding you about this, but in the past, 
we've all made a list of what we called our three set free. Three people in our lives that we have a relationship with who don't know Jesus. People that we want to see set free through placing their faith in Him. People in prison, in bondage to addiction, to selfish or selfishness, to things of this world, to hopelessness. I want to remind you and encourage you to write down a list of three names, your three set free, and pray for them each day. And pray for yourself that you would be prepared and ready to step into an opportunity that God might give you in that person's life. Wouldn't it be exciting that in the story of people that we love, when they look back at the time when they were in bondage, that they could say that part of their story was that the church was earnestly praying to God for them. Now getting back to the story of Peter in Acts 12, verses 6 through 10 say, The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Now, the thing that kind of cracks me up about this passage is the way that the angel treats Peter. This seems to be kind of a no-nonsense angel. He's like, hey, hey, come on, follow me. And when it says that the angel struck him to wake him up, the word actually means to smite or to strike as with a sword. This seemed like a pretty rude awakening. My dad was a morning person. When he woke us up, or when he got up, he would be all peppy and bright-eyed, and the rest of our family would kind of be dragging around the house and, uh, you know, taking a while to wake up, especially my sister and I. And if my mom woke us up, she would come in and she'd rub our backs gently and say, it's time to get up, you know, start getting ready, and then she'd leave for a while and she'd come back in later and get us moving a little bit more. But my dad, on the other hand, would come in, usually kind of humming some song, going like, do, 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 and he'd come in, he'd flip the light on and say at full volume, come on, time to get up. And then he'd do, da, do, 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 boop, da, da, back into the hall, and we'd be like, ah, dad, come on, we're just trying to wake up. It was definitely more of an abrupt and shocking awakening than what we got from my mom. And the angel in Peter's prison cell definitely takes the abrupt approach to waking him up. But I think the interesting thing is that the angel had to be forceful or really even that he had to wake Peter up in the first place. Peter here shows us we can have peace in any situation when our faith is in the prince of peace. Just put yourself in his place. You're part of a group of Christians that's been attacked repeatedly. Now one of the most powerful political figures in your area has his sights set on you. He's already executed one of your close friends, and you are in prison up for trial the next morning. You're surrounded by 16 soldiers whose sole job is to keep you in that cell. The writing's on the wall. If Herod has his way, you probably won't live past lunch tomorrow. I know I wouldn't be sleeping too soundly. I'd be asking for my one phone call. I'd be Wait, wanting to get a hold of a lawyer who might be able to somehow get me out of there. I'd, I'd be crying out to God, please save me. How could you let this happen to me? James is dead. I'm in prison. I'm scared. I don't want to do this. This isn't fair. But Peter, he's just snoozing away, peaceful as can be. The light from the angel that comes in and fills the cell doesn't even wake him up. The angel really had to work to just roust him out at all. And the source of Peter's peace is the same source that we can have. It goes back to what he said in John chapter 6. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Peter knew. He didn't just hope and think. He knew in his bones that Jesus is the Holy One of God. He knew that it was God who was sovereign, whether that meant 
life or death for Peter. He knew that his faith, his commitment, and his trust were in Jesus. And so he could sleep like a log when he had every earthly reason to be in panic mode. In fact, Peter doesn't even realize that this is really even happening at first. He thinks he's having a vision. That is, until the angel suddenly disappears, and once they get down to the end of the street. And then it says Peter kind of came to his senses, and he realizes, wait a minute, that angel was real, and I really am out of prison. Nice, okay. And then as we continue in Acts 12, 12 through 16, it says, when this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter's at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Have you ever had that happen to you? Have you ever had a prayer answered in a miraculous way and been shocked like that? I have. And the funny thing is that we're shocked by it. We pray and we ask God for something, and then we're astonished when something actually happens. But many times we pray, we say what we think we should say, we ask for what we think we should ask for, but we don't really expect God to act. I remember hearing a man speak once when I was in high school, and he was a preacher, and he talked about how one time he had been invited to preach at a week of meetings in another town. And one night after the meeting was over, a lady came up to him with her young son who had very substantial leg braces and also crutches that he used to walk. Just taking one step was a major effort for this boy. And the mother asked this preacher to please pray for her boy. And he was kind of caught off guard, but he said he wanted to make the mom feel better. And he thought, well, I'm supposed to anoint him with oil of some kind, I guess. And so he went quickly next door to a little store, but all they had was cans of Del Monte olives. And so he bought a can and he poured some of the olive juice into a different container to sort of hide where he was getting it from. And he said he, he really tried his best to pray a prayer that would sound good and make the mom feel better and sound kind of flowery and impressive. And when he finished praying, the boy and his mother thanked him and they left. And the next night was the last night of this conference, and he finished speaking, and after the meeting, the woman and her son came back up to talk with him. But the boy was walking perfectly fine without any braces or crutches at all. And they thanked him for praying for the boy, and they were so excited and grateful. And this man said he just stood there with his mouth hanging open because he couldn't believe it. Here was this boy standing in front of him, healed, and this preacher was speechless because he hadn't expected God to do what they asked him to do. And I think we do things like that because we think we know the way that God will do things. But we can't anticipate how God will work. If we've seen God work in one way, we tend to think that that's the way he's always going to do things. But God's unpredictable. He defies our expectations and he disregards the boxes that we try to put him in. These people in the early church were not expecting Peter to show up at the door, even though they were praying for him. Maybe they were expecting God to help him during his trial, like he had with the Sanhedrin before or whatever. Even Peter, who'd been miraculously released from prison before in Acts chapter 5, isn't expecting what God does. When we pray to God, we have to be prepared for anything. He can and will work in the way that accomplishes his will and works toward his glory. And so our goal and what we do and how we pray should be the same, that his will would be done and that you know, in us and through us and that he would be glorified. And at the end of the chapter, we see an example of what happens when someone tries to glorify themselves. After Peter had finally been let in the door, he calms the people down who are there and explains to them what happened. And then he leaves. And in the morning, there's chaos in the prison as they discover that Peter's not in his cell where he's supposed to be. And Herod questions the guards and they don't have an explanation. And so Herod has them executed. And then it says Herod goes to Caesarea because he's been having this disagreement with other cities in the area. 
But because those cities relied on Herod for their food, they kind of had to kiss up to him, basically. And so Herod agrees to peace with them, and he grants these rival cities an audience with him. And then in Acts 12, 21 through 24, it says, On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, This is the voice of a God, not a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God continued to spread and flourish. That sounds pretty gruesome, right? But it's an example of the difference between living for God's glory or living for our own. Our own glory is momentary. God's glory is eternal. Herod, like his father and grandfather before him, was obsessed with power and control. He was set on gaining as much in this world as possible. But when he died, that would amount to absolutely nothing. But let's contrast his attitude with Peter when he went to the house of Cornelius in Acts chapter 11. You remember that? In verse 25 and 26, it says, As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said, I am only a man myself. Peter knew that he wasn't the one who was worthy of worship and reverence. He was just a messenger and a follower of the one who was worthy. Herod reveled in the attention that he got. Sitting in his royal robes, he gladly accepted the praise as they said that his voice was the voice of a God. And immediately he lost all of the glory that he ever had. Actually, the fact that he was merely a man was obvious to everybody as his body is devoured by worms. I don't even know what that looks like. And yet God's will, his glory, his word continued to spread and to flourish. And so we have a choice if we're going to live for God's glory or live for our own. There's going to be storms and suffering in this life either way, but our suffering can be for the glory of God. And in the midst of the storm, we can have peace if our belief and our faith are in the one who's worthy. When we live for God's glory, we're investing our lives in his kingdom and in his glory that will last forever. Let's pray. Father, thank you for giving us a chance to invest our lives in your kingdom. That you saw us lost in our sin, living for our own glory, living for things that were momentary and temporary and wouldn't last, living for ourselves and being lost in that. And you didn't just leave us there. You didn't leave us to our own devices. You didn't leave us failing in our own strength. But you sent Jesus to save us so that we could place our faith in him and know that even in the sufferings in this life, we can have peace. We can have hope. We can have a future in eternity. We thank you that our lives can be be a part of your plan and your kingdom and your will. And we pray that your will would be done in our lives and that you would receive the glory for all that we do. We pray that you would show us opportunities to do that each day as we continue to submit ourselves to your sovereignty and allow you to work in us and through us. And and we thank you for uh, all you've done for us and, and you continue to do for us every day. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Your heart and lead me in your love. 
look at the person of King David in Scripture, we see right away that he was not a perfect man. David's sins and faults and failures are laid right out there for everybody to see in the stories that we read about him and his life. And yet he's called a man after God's own heart. And a lot of that is because of his willingness and his ability to repent, to come to God and to, to ask for forgiveness to own up to his failures and his sins and to ask God for forgiveness and another chance. And David wrote in Psalm 32 some words that I think apply to us as we come to communion, as we repent, as we ask God again for a a new beginning, another chance of forgiveness and and another uh, beginning Psalm 32, beginning in verse 1, says, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. And I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. So as we think about communion this morning, let's remember that we are truly blessed because Our sins are not counted against us because of the sacrifice that Jesus made, that we're surrounded by deliverance through him. So let's take the bread 
to remember the body of Jesus that was broken to bring that deliverance to us. And let's take the juice together to remember his blood that was poured out so that our sins may not be counted against us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for a chance each week to come and to remember the price that was paid for our sins and for our forgiveness and for our salvation. We pray that you would help us not to try to hold on to or hide iniquities, as, as David called them, because we know that that's a weight that we carry around when we do that. We want to allow you to relieve us of that. We want to give ourselves over more fully to you each day. We want to uh, allow you to work in our lives and to not hold back areas where we, we hold on to sin. So we repent and we ask for forgiveness today as we remember the price that was paid and we ask that you would uh, be at work in us and shape us more into the image of Jesus. And we ask it in his name. Amen. As we come to our time of giving, I just want to remind you that your giving is important and that your giving matters. Yes, it's important because it's something that God asks us to do that uh, it is honoring to him, it's a, an act of worship, and it is a uh, positive thing for us to help us keep things in perspective in our life. But also, giving enables the work of God's kingdom to move forward. The mission of Christ, which is the mission of this church, your giving supports not only the mission of this church to take the gospel to this community, but also the mission of Christ around the world, because we support missionaries who are taking the gospel to all corners of the world. We're going to get to hear from a couple of them next week, uh, missionaries from Germany. But I want to read from Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 30, 13. It says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And we can be those who bring good news. Each day in our everyday lives as we proclaim the gospel through all that we do, as a church, as we impact our community and we, we preach the gospel and proclaim it through, through our activities and, and our relationship with our community and our neighborhood, through the missionaries that we support around the world, the gospel can move forward. And all of that is possible because of the giving that you so faithfully uh, continue to give. And I, I want to thank you for that and encourage you to continue to support the mission of Christ in this world. Thank you again for being a part of our worship service this morning. I want to invite you back next week, 10.30 a.m. We'll be here online and in person at the church. We're going to be joined by some special guests, the Farkirchers, uh, Jesse and Toby Farkircher, who are missionaries in Berlin, Germany, who we support. They're going to be spending next Sunday with us. Uh, telling us about the work that they're doing there and what God is doing uh, through their efforts. And so I hope that you can be a part of that as we, we uh, get to experience celebrating and, and encouraging uh, some people who we're supporting in their ministry and their mission. Let's pray together as we close our service this morning. Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for the way that you are at work. And we don't always know how that is going to work out. We don't know how you are working and what you're doing, but we know that your will is the best for us. So we ask that you would help us to not assume anything, that you'd help us to believe and to trust and to be able to say, as Peter did, we have come to know and believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that our faith would be in him and that our faith would be something that brings peace to us and boldness and, and courage to do the things you've called us to do and to, to know that uh, our lives are in your hands and we're very grateful for that assurance that we have. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Because He lives. 